Good afternoon and welcome to the last in the London Sinfonietta series, Introduction to Contemporary Instruments. I'm Melinda Maxwell and I'm a guest principal with the London Sinfonietta. This series of lockdown events, performed live from our homes, has been occurring every Monday this month and has looked at a new instrument each week. Do subscribe to the London Sinfonietta's YouTube channel you can see the subscribe button, I think, somewhere on your screens there, where you can check out previous events in this series. Details of these events and many others can be found on the London Sinfonietta website. During this session, you can send me any questions you'd like to ask, at, and which I will answer at the end, or any comments you'd like to make via the YouTube chat on your screens. And lastly, and most importantly, the Sinfonietta is very grateful to all the trusts, the sponsors, the individuals and the Arts Council for their investment and support in the work that the Sinfonietta does. So today I'm going to share with you three pieces this afternoon. The first will be a piece of my own called Sounding Out Verez, which is essentially an improvisation, more of that in a moment. The second piece is a piece written for me in 1981 by Sir Harrison Birtwistle called Pulse Sampler and um, my glamorous assistant here, David Purser, my husband, uh, now retired but was principal trombone of the London Sinfonietta for over 35 years, will be my claves player this afternoon. And then lastly, I'm going to play a brand new piece. This is very, very exciting. This is um, absolutely new. This will be the first time anybody will hear it and it will be you listening out there today, and it's by uh, a wonderful composer called Simon Holt, and his piece is called Raw Air. Okay, <clears throat> now then, just, just before I start playing, I just want to set the scene a little bit with a bit of context. Um, you might think that the oboe, certainly up until the middle of the last century, certainly had a very quaint and pastoral image, I think. Um, its character is interesting because it's not particularly versatile in how it moves around quickly, unlike the agility of, say, the flute and the clarinet. Um, it has quite a small range. It has just over two and a half octaves. The lowest note is a B-flat below middle C, and the highest note is now an A. It was G, it is now an A, four ledger lines up. And it's very difficult to play extremely quietly on the oboe, particularly in the bottom register. It's a sound that is so rich that it's either on or off, and it's almost impossible to mute. We sometimes put a little bit of cloth up the bell to, to try and help the bottom notes, and psychologically it makes things a bit easier. But we can't mute the oboe. Sometimes we can put a cloth over the whole instrument and you can see our fingers moving, but it doesn't really work very well. But having said all that, these limitations that there are, there are a couple of aspects about the oboe that are really quite interesting and extraordinary. Um, now, with, with a lot of the fingerings that we use, we can subtract or add more fingers to colour the tone of the oboe, which is a very rich sound. So by covering more holes and we make a more covered sound, the sound is softer. And then if we take fingers away, it opens up the sound and it becomes louder. So these timbral colours, the different, um, you know, the greens and the blues or the reds are things that, that make the dynamic change. So we can do our dynamics by colouring. The other extraordinary thing about this instrument is that the like a lot of wind instruments, we have things called multiphonics. And these are chords of more than two notes. And in the oboe, we have over 400 of these chords. And they are completely independent. We play with unorthodox fingerings, and suddenly these characters pop out of the instrument. Let me just demonstrate uh, a loud one. This is a loud multiphonic. So it only exists in that, in that dynamic. If I was to play much softer, we'd come down to a very flat B flat um, and the, the, the chord would disappear. And then if I can find a soft one, that 
that only exists at that dynamic and it's 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 you know we can almost become inaudible on the oboe doing these things now what interests me about this side of the oboe is that it's almost like there's a sort of beast within the flip side of this pastoral character suddenly reveals a sort of ancient world a very earthy one where where this sound is just there it's revealed so i love that about this instrument and of course the reason for these chords because we have so many it's because when we play one note we call it the fundamental each note that ever sounds in the world has a series of harmonics within it that, that color and characterize the tone in the oboe these these little harmonic sounds are very very tightly packed and so i think this is what enables these multiphonics to to bloom and come out um, so the the most important piece that was written in the middle of the 20th century that that used these two aspects of the oboe beautifully was a piece by luciano berio called sequenza seven for solo oboe that, that, that was commissioned <coughs> excuse me that was commissioned by heinz holliger the great heinz holliger to whom i think all oboists are indebted because he has commissioned some fantastic pieces for our instrument and since that piece there's been a wealth of music in the modern world for instance we have thanks to holiger we have some beautiful works by takamitsu um beautiful ones by elliot carter lutislavsky um and then just to add to that bruno moderna is a composer who who loved the instrument and wrote three oboe concertos for it so despite the limitations there are lots of things that we can do that that are fascinating so let's start with my piece now which is called sounding out the res and as the title suggests this is a sounding out of the res so um it's based on the opening melody of a piece called octandre for seven wind instruments and a double bass so why don't i play that to you now melody it's extremely expressive and lyrical and it has this sort of modern lyricism and it expands as it moves through and there are specific intervals that make the melody grow and broaden and it finishes with with a very very <clears throat> extreme register at the very bottom to the very top so let's just have a look at the score for one moment because this is quite unusual this is my handwriting. I don't think I could ever do this on Sibelius. It would get very confused. So we have three circles and we start at circle A and move to circle B and then on to the A plus B. In the first two circles, you can see there are fragments of notes. These are fragments from that melody that I've just played to you. And they are suggested fragments. You can choose other fragments to play. And these fragments are to enable the improviser to build on material from these notes. So let's just quickly move to the transposition sheet. Okay, now if we look to the left there, we can see there's a, there's a word that says prime. Those three notes are the first notes of the melody. So I've just put them in a scalic form so it's easy to see. And then there are two rotations and these are called um, rotational arrays. This is something Stravinsky 
used and, and developed a lot. And it's just a way of sampling a cell from all angles. And it sounds very different. You can change registers, you can change articulation. So already that gives one a lot of scope. And then I've just shown that by using the interval of a major third, I can transpose those three notes into different bits of material that relate to each other. Okay, so you can choose a different interval if you wanted to. So let's just go back to the score again. Okay, so the first two circles are, are what I call structured improvisation. There are, there are sort of rules that we need to obey because we need to keep the flavour of res. Once we move into the last circle, it's completely open and the player can, can sample anything from A and B if they want or not and there are some rhythmic figurations that can be developed and an interval of a fifth which is what Verez uses in the middle of that melody you might remember where things begin to open out and broaden and develop. So into the middle circle there's a major third which happens um, two lines down into the melody which instigates a more broadening of the intervals and then a minor third later on is a sort of total awakening. Right, I'm going to play you um, this piece and I just want to uh, say that this, this is for any melody instrument. Um, it could be a tuba or a double bass or a piccolo, anything. Okay, this is sounding up the res. of course it's never going to be the same twice and this is something that I love about improvising it happens at the moment and when I did my masters in jazz recently um, it was very obvious that what jazz musicians do is they revere a piece there's a reverential exploration of the material so there are many versions of standards like autumn leaves and they all have the personality of the player, but it's very much couched in the language of what they're revering. So that's, 
that's what my piece is about. Now, David, are you there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, let's, let's have a look at Burt Whistle. Now, the name Pulse Sampler. Pulse, we know. Uh, sampler is like sampling, tasting. But sampler is also a piece of, piece of cloth that is, um, shows the method of weaving um, and the techniques of weaving. So this is very but Whistlian. We have lines, um, parallel lines, lines that, that contort in all sorts of different ways. And in this piece, pulse is totally significant. And in the 28 pauses that happen during this piece, the clays player gives the oboist a pulse, the oboist takes the pulse and immediately the clays player has to change the pulse through some form of metrical modulation. So I think the the pulse in this piece is that ninety? I'll show you. It's not that much too slow. Much too slow. Right, there's ninety. So this is the middle sort of pulse of the piece. It could be half as slow, twice as fast. Now to get to seventy two beats per second we have to create a way of doing this. So if we subdivide this into four, like that, and then add an extra one of the fast notes, we get a slower tempo. So, and we get that slower tempo. So some of these metrical modulations are quite complex and there are sometimes three steps you have to make. But the exciting thing about this piece is that because there is a mobile at the front of the piece of the clays player with which he improvises, so there's a sort of, there are some patterns of rhythms that he can sample as he moves through the pulse. So it means that every single performance is different and there's a different feeling about it. The synchronizations maybe don't quite happen. Sometimes they do. Sometimes we do play at min and 45 or crotch at 90. Um, but essentially we're not together and that's the tension in the piece. So let's play the opening. This is the opening of Pulse Sampler. and here the oboist is suddenly alone on a pulse the clays player has is suddenly silent and this is a very dra dramatic moment in the piece but unfortunately the claves wins and he comes in with a very loud sound and the pulsing begins on an E again it starts on an E this piece this time it's on a high E pulsing away uh, before a massive flourish from the bottom of the instrument to the top and we have one sound that suddenly appears at the end which is on the wood block which is a sort of final it can't possibly continue it could probably this piece could go round and round and round and round but it will end with a wood block here we go
Again, a wonderful title by Simon. His, his titles give a hint of what's to come, always. His music is utterly compelling, and he's written for me before, I think, at least six times. This is his seventh piece for me, and it really is a wonderful privilege to play his music, because I love it. And he's asked me to read this to you before I play it. The title for the piece my good friend Melinda Maxwell is about to play is taken from a poem that seems never to leave my life, Sopressa by Federico Garcia Lorca. It was the basis for a piece I wrote many years ago called Era Madrugada, which I wrote for the National Ensemble in 1984. The poem itself was derived from a newspaper article that Lorca read about the discovery of the body of an unknown person in the street with a knife in its chest. Lorca describes the eyes as being open to raw air. Raw air is what the oboist takes in to express what will transform into meaningful sound when exhaled through the instrument. So a violent story and in fact the violence is certainly depicted a lot in Simon's music. It's, it's, there's no compromise. Now let's have a look at the first page of the score. Okay, here we go then. Now you can see we have this mesto, which means sad, melancholic, a slow pulse with the high oboe um, playing and floating in this beautiful sereneness, although there's always a little bit of tension in the sereneness. One never quite knows where it's going. And you can see, a sixth line down, or wherever it is, things suddenly change. Um, into the complete opposite. We have agitato, we have unleashed, and we have a volando, flying, and suddenly the oboe is, is in a completely different place. It's dangerous, it's fast, and it whizzes around all over the place. So basically this piece is the, these two opposites, these two bits of textures, material, that are juxtaposed and played with during the piece. And there's one little dyad which you'll hear, a two-note chord, which are very soft, and there are only five of them on the oboe, but he's used one of those. Okay, I'm now going to perform Raw Air by Simon Holt.
Thank you, Simon. Thank you very much. There we have the world premiere of Raw Air. I should say that it, it does have a piano part as well, which is ad lib. Um, but today it was with solo oboe. Now then, I've got a few questions coming in here. Um, oh, Mark Alexander, which composer would you like to write a new piece for you? Oh, heavens above. Well, goodness me. Um, well, there's a very interesting British composer, George Benjamin, whose music I love, and Tom Addis. There's Wolfgang Riem in Germany. That's a really difficult question to answer straight away. Um, but certainly I would say either George Benjamin or Tom Addis. That would be a, that would be a real thing to have, absolutely. Um, and then there's another one from Mana Shibata. What is the first thing you do when you open a brand new piece of music to play? Okay, well I take it very slowly, indeed, one step at a time, and I have to find a way in, and it needs to be a very slow process this, so that um, there's no stone unturned. So it's lots of very slow practicing with it, and gradually bringing it into a place where its character will then be revealed. Um, I think that's, um, def I've just noticed my battery is getting very low. Just excuse me one second. Um, very simple, just need to plug it in. Um, okay, uh, Tariq Khan, what is the most challenging over piece or part you've had to play and which piece is your favorite? pieces for the oboe to perform. Oof. Wow. Well, I have to say the pulse sampler that you've just heard, the whole of that was the most challenging thing I think I'd ever experienced in, in the early 80s. I had never had to be so physically uh, ready. I mean, it's not just the mental side, but it's like preparing as an athlete. You know, you have to get your physical um, playing into a space where you know you can trust it and and certainly the pulse sampler which is four large pages um you probably can't see um of performing there's no let up there's no pause and it is quite draining i've i've, I've found that one of the most challenging things ha having said that you know the more one does these things the easier it gets um uh, i'm just trying to look at the, the rest of that question or part you have had to play uh, in which pieces your favourite pieces? Um, let's think now. Actually, there's some Colin Matthews that's that's extremely difficult, um, which takes a lot of a lot of learning. And in fact, I have to say, you know, there are pieces that have extended techniques like Lachemann and um, actually Donatoni, the Italian. But when when we use extended techniques, um, it's very hard. Rebecca Saunders is actually. A, a wonderful composer because she really has studied uh, multiphonics, but they are they are pieces that are that take an awful lot of time. Now, having said that, I have to say to you all that it is worth it. <laughs> ah! um, I've had some of the greatest moments of my life playing new music, and I wouldn't have been without it for the world. And also, I love working with composers. Um, you know, it's really great to talk to them about what they've written and why they've written it and what they listen to, uh, what they eat, what books they like. You know, it's all part of learning the personality. Um, now, wait a minute, there's something else come in here. For contemporary music, do you use a metronome? Since from what I know, the pulse changes all the time throughout the piece. Yes, um, only when I'm, I tend to learn pulses actually. I learn a pulse and I only use the metronome when I need to check that I'm playing at the right tempo, um, particularly when there's something very difficult. But one does learn tempi, and um, usually the music likes to sit in the tempo that it's written in, so you can sort of gauge where that is. But I have to say, metronome markings are very loose. You know, they don't have to be completely, um, completely adhere to because one has to get the spirit right and it all depends on the acoustic that you're playing in the, the type of hall you know what 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 resonance it has so it's it's a sort of open place really um oh 
here's one from Simon. What a privilege for me, Melinda. Many, many thanks. Well, I think that's a great place to stop. And I have to say thank you, Simon. When you sent this piece to me um, a few months ago, I thought I need to find a place to play it. And here it was, perfect, in a live lockdown. So thank you very much, everybody. Stay safe. Despite the terrible things that are happening right now, uh, we might know something about Dominic Cummings. Anyway, I think it's bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.